never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard me and saved me from my enemies. The Son of God surrounds his face. He will deliver There we go. All right. Okay. Good morning, Fireside. All right. Happy Resurrection Day. We are so thankful to be gathered here as the house of the Lord to 
celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, if you are a guest here today, we just want to welcome you and thank you for uh, attending today. We have a special little booklet that we'll, uh, we'll try to get to you as soon as we can. And we just ask you to st just hang out with us. We don't bite too much. Uh, we would love to get to know you, get to hang out with you, and just celebrate the Lord's resurrection with you today. Uh, would you join me this morning in prayer as we go to our Lord? Our Lord, we give you thanks so much. We thank you for Christ, the first fruits of the resurrection, Lord, in which you have promised us that we will follow as we turn in faith and obedience to Christ, Lord. We thank you this morning for allowing us to gather this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, as we observe the seasons, as we observe your creation, your sovereign hand over the entire world, which turns it from cold to warm, which turns the trees from bare to budding, and we see the growth and Lord, we, we see that and we just marvel. So Lord, we thank you for your majesty, who you are, your creation, and Lord, even redemption that we have in Christ Jesus this morning. Lord, we want to bring our prayers and petitions to you this morning. Lord, we have many who, who are sick, who are not feeling well. And Lord, we pray for those who are sick. Lord, may your gracious and sovereign hand be upon them. Lord, may you heal them. Lord, may you restore their bodies so that may we may gather again and worship you. Lord, we pray that in the midst of anyone who is uh, suffering with illness right now, that, Lord, they would suffer well. Lord, they would see you through the difficult, they would, they would focus on you through the difficulty. And, Lord, entrust in you for healing. Lord, we want to lift up particularly uh, Tristan this morning uh, as he is in uh, great pain with his back, Lord. May you have your hand upon him, Lord. May you be gracious to him. May you relieve his pain. May you cause him to focus on you and, his, and, and you sustaining him this morning, Lord. Lord, we want to remember Bethany as she is um, very, very close to delivering this baby, Lord. Lord, we pray that you would be with the stewards, the family, in this time, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for a health, a healthy uh, baby, a safe delivery. Lord, and, uh, just, and just welcoming life into this world and the blessing that that is, Lord. Lord, we also want to remember Colleen. Lord, may you help her as she is continuing to deal with pain. Lord, may you place your hand upon her. May you comfort her. May you relieve her pain, Lord. May you help the doctors to give her wisdom and understanding what exactly is wrong. And Lord, what, uh, may you use them tremendously to relieve her of her suffering at this point. So, Lord, we pray in all of these for all who are sick, all who are suffering, Lord. May they keep their eyes and focus upon you and your resurrection, Lord, that one day you will give us bodies where we will never suffer again. We will never cry again. And, Lord, we will see your face forever, and we will magnify your name, Lord. Lord, we pray this morning this service is acceptable to you. We pray you would bless our gathering, and we ask them in the name of your resurrected Son. Amen. Would you stand with me for the reading of the word this morning? All right, I'm going to do a uh, two-part reading, so... Patience, please. After these things, the word of the Lord, I'm sorry, this is Genesis 15, 1, uh, starting with verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am your, a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me, since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Then behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man will not be your heir. But one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So then, of course, shortly thereafter, he, he being Abram, takes Isaac up on the hill. I think we're mostly familiar with that. So this is following up from that. 
Then the angel of the Lord called to Abram a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. Indeed, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And I believe we all know that uh, we were all blessed in that seed.
stars, let the soldiers hold and nail him down, so that he could save them. See him there upon the cross. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we come before you today in humble adoration, acknowledging your infinite holiness and majesty as a congregation gathered in this place, united in faith and fellowship. We stand in awe of your perfect righteousness. Lord, in your holiness, we see the vast chasm that our sins have created between us and you. We confess our transgressions, our failures, our weaknesses, knowing that it is only by your grace that we can stand before you. Have mercy on us and forgive us for our sins. Lord, on this blessed Easter Sunday, our hearts are filled with gratitude and joy as we celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the victory over death and the grave, a victory that assures us of our hope and our future. As we reflect on your word this morning, we are reminded of the foundational truth of our faith, that Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Father, we thank you for the assurance that because Christ lives, we too shall live. In his resurrection, we see the defeat of sin and death and the promise of eternal life for all who believe in him. Lord, we pray that this message of hope and salvation would resonate deeply within our hearts today. May it strengthen us, encourage us, and compel us to live lives that glorify you. We ask, O oh God, that you would prepare our hearts now to receive your word. As Wayne comes to, to deliver the sermon, we pray that you would anoint him with your Holy Spirit. Grant him clarity, wisdom, and passion as he unfolds the truths of Scripture. May our hearts be fertile ground for your word, ready to receive and to be transformed by it. Lord, we are grateful for this congregation. Thank you for bringing us together in this place, for the fellowship we share, and the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. 
As we continue in our service, may our songs, our prayers, and our listening be pleasing in your sight. In the precious name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Fireside. All right. If you would, uh, open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Have you ever thought what it would be like if Jesus had not resurrected from the grave? You know, and, and with Easter sermons, we're often given the message of hope. We are often told the positive aspects, conquering death, forgiveness of sins. We're often given all the positive aspects, but did you know, do you ever consider what, what is the other side of that coin? What happens, what would happen, how would life be if Jesus did not resurrect from the grave? The apostle Paul gives us that other side of the coin. What would life be like? What would, what would your standing before God be like if Jesus was never resurrected from the grave. And you know, uh, we, we may wonder that, but millions of people throughout the world live like that every single day because they don't believe it. They simply don't believe it. World-renowned atheist, Dr. Anthony Flew, who was probably one of the most influential and popular, um, no, popularly known atheist of the previous generation, he was a British philosopher and a professor at Oxford, at Cambridge, he taught all sorts of people. He even personally debated C.S. Lewis on a regular occurrence at his school where he taught. And he taught, uh, Dr. Flew taught for over 30 years on the concept of atheism, and he argued for that, uh, you know, vociferously argued for that. In 2007, he wrote a book on how he felt when considering the claims of Christianity in the Bible. He said, when Alice journeyed through the looking glass in Lewis Carroll's famous fantasy book, Alice met a queen who claimed to be 101, five months and one day old. Being that the queen's uh, appearance certainly didn't appear that way, Alice responded, I can't believe that. Oh, can't you, the queen said in a pitying tone, try again. Draw a long breath and shut your eyes. <laughs> Alice laughed. <laughs> There's no use in trying, she said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. Why, when I was your age, sometimes I believe as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Dr. Flew then equipped, I dare say that I must sympathize with Alice. I dare say. Most of the world today sympathizes with Alice. They see a church as some lying monarch with some providentially bestowed power that you're just supposed to believe whatever the queen or king says. And the church looks and they quip like, can't believe in possible things. It's ridiculous. People resurrect from the dead. When people die, they stay dead. That's what people do. I mean, how many people do you know that have come back from the dead? I'll wait. And the world, like Alice, says you simply can't believe impossible things. Resurrection from the dead, come on, come on. But as we're gonna see, the resurrection is a true historical fact that without which your life is given entirely to futility you are still in your sins unforgiven, and therefore, you are still under the judgment of Almighty God. And we're going to see three aspects of this and how Paul approaches the Corinthian church, who also believed the same thing. Resurrection from the dead? There's a body that you get afterwards? No way. No way. 
And we're going to see this morning the Apostle Paul's response. So turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We will start in verse 12. Paul says to the church in Corinth, Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God, because we have testified about God, that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the word of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, if there's any point I can make today, any, any two points I can make today, first, Without Jesus' resurrection, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins, and you are under the judgment of God. And sometimes I think, as Christians, we can forget just how important the resurrection is. If Jesus died for your sins, but he didn't resurrect, it's all for nothing. It's all a wash. The resurrection is proof that God accepted the sacrifice of Christ on behalf of his people. The resurrection is proof that God was pleased with Christ and by his power resurrected Jesus. And without any of the resurrection, without the centrality of the resurrection to the Christian doctrine, Christian life, Christian living, Christian thinking, Christian everything, it is all worthless. And the Corinthians struggled with that. And they believed in a different, in a, the, the resurrection, they were like, ah, oh, maybe not, maybe not. And, and Paul said, how in the world does Christianity even make sense without the resurrection of Christ. And so Paul kind of plays a rhetorical game with them and says, well, if it didn't happen, if the resurrection of Christ is not true, and then he begins to go through a series of events of explaining the, the consequences if Christ was not resurrected. And then Paul just gets to the truth. But praise God, Jesus did rise from the grave. This is true historical fact. People like Dr. Anthony Flew who devote their whole lives to disputing the truth. He, he has won so many accolades. He's won scholarships to even go to school. He has been praised by many people. He has been given intellectual awards, but he's wrong. As intelligent as people proclaim him, he's wrong. How intelligent is it to be wrong? Because God did 
rise from the grave. Jesus is God. Jesus did rise from the grave. Jesus did live a perfect life, conquered death, and rose from the grave as proof. He showed himself to hundreds of witnesses who saw him and gave eyewitness testimony to this truth. And the Apostle Paul explains the, 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 the centrality of this truth to the Corinthians in three ways. First, he says, what would happen, what would it be like? What, what are the consequences if Christ is not raised? Second, and then he gets to the truth, but Christ is raised. And then he gets to the so what? So what does that mean? And what, what I kind of want to set before you right now is Paul does not respond here in a way that says, well, you know, as long as you believe in Jesus Christ, whether he resurrected from the grave or not doesn't really matter. You will see that Paul cares about details. He cares about doctrine. And there's this concept or idea that, you know, doctrine divides. You know, we just, we just, we just love Jesus and that's it. Doctrine divides. And Paul says, well, if you get your doctrine wrong enough, if, if you get this wrong, if Christ is not raised, your faith is futile. He doesn't say, oh, it's okay. All you got to do is just believe in Jesus. He says, no, if you don't believe these specific things, your faith is futile. You can claim to be, believe in Jesus, but you're still in your sins. Your faith is in vain, and you are still under judgment. Even if you hold a Bible, you go to church, and you say, and you proclaim that you believe in Jesus. It is so vitally important what you think about Jesus. And this idea of, well, as long as you have this little kernel of truth, you just believe in Jesus. And if you do that, that's all that's, all that's really necessary in life, just believing in Jesus. Paul says, no, 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 no. What you think about Jesus even has eternal implications on whether you make it to heaven with Christ or you sit under judgment under Christ. Paul cares deeply about exactly and specifically what the Corinthians think. And he goes in, into the tremendous labors to show them why. And so first, Paul says, Paul, Paul addresses what would it be? What would it mean? Why should you not just say, well, you know, I believe in Jesus and, you know, yeah, I believe in the Bible. That should be enough. I don't need theology. I'm just a simple Christian I just believe in Jesus. We'll see what Paul says. Well, if, if you think of the resurrection that way, let's see, what, let's see what implications that has. So first, he says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Now, I, I wanna point out just a couple of things with this. Before Paul gets into the ramifications, he says, hey, wait a minute. This is what we proclaimed. This is what the apostles proclaimed when he was saved on the road to Damascus and then he went away and he was trained and then he met with the apostles and they all affirmed his doctrine. They unanimously proclaimed the, that Christ was resurrected physically and bodily from the grave. So it wasn't some like spiritual idea. No, he actually had a physical body when he was resurrected. And this is what was proclaimed by the apostles unanimously, without exception, all the time. And then Paul says, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection? And look, if nothing else, I want you to take from this verse, ancient people get a bad rap. Ancient people get a bad rap. You know, we think they're total fools. We think... Our world tends to think, well, we're more enlightened than they are. We have more intelligence. We have science. They didn't really have that back in the day. So they just believed in foolish things. Modern people, by default, tend to think of ancient people as like, like something like gullible fools or something. Just because they don't have an iPhone and drive a Tesla doesn't mean they all deserve to be thought on the same level as like the Flintstones, where they all drove a car by pedaling their feet, have the IQ of Barney Rubble, and have a baby mammoth as a vacuum cleaner. That's not like, ancient people weren't total fools. These people in, had incredible inventions that we take for granted. Wheeled vehicles, the magnetic compass. You didn't even understand radio waves at that time. They navigated the earth by looking at stars and positioning themselves exactly on this planet. You're, 
the ancient people aren't fools. And again, just mentioning C.S. Lewis's name again, he was one of the greatest Christian thinkers in the last century. When, when thinking about ancient people and how people just kind of lay over this facade of foolishness over them, C.S. Lewis said of being conceived by the Holy Spirit, of Jesus' conception by the Holy Spirit, said, Jesus' parents weren't liars and everyone else was just some gullible fool. Joseph and Mary accepted the conception as a miracle, not because they didn't know how babies were made, because they did know how babies were made. That's why Joseph sought to divorce Mary, because he said, oh, that's not how babies are made. He's not some gullible fool. And so when people in the ancient world were presented with the Christian claims of resurrection from the dead, they were flabbergasted. They were like, what? They weren't some people who were like, resurrection, okay, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, uh, and have a club or something, you know? They were reasonable people. They were intelligent. They had IQs as well. And they didn't just accept any claim and because ancient people knew just like where babies come from, they also know that when someone dies, they stay dead. And so they thought, there's no resurrection from the dead. We've never seen this before. This doesn't happen every weekend. And so there, ancient people are not simply some people we should think about who are just gullible, who had no science, no understanding of how the world really worked. And so therefore, they just believed in everything. So that's where the Bible gets this idea of resurrection from the dead. Okay. But we, we're smart. We have science. We know that can't happen today. And so all of this stuff, all of this Bible stuff is just fantasy and fairy tales. It's much like the queen and Alice. Can't believe in possible things. And so if nothing else, when you look at this verse, ancient folks didn't just accept anything because they didn't have science. No, they knew that dead people stayed dead. And so they questioned. They thought, no, that, is that real? This is something earth-shatteringly different. This is Jesus Christ raised from the dead. So if nothing else, just remember, there, were, there was a reason that, that ancient folks questioned this, because it's miraculous. It doesn't happen every day. How, how, many, how many resurrected people you know? One, Jesus, two, maybe Lazarus. You know, you, you read about them in the Bible. But how many people in your lifetime do you know who are resurrected from the dead after being in the grave three days? Yeah, zero. And so they questioned. They said, hey, how, how can this be? And Paul presents them with the ramifications. If there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And so Paul, it, it's widely agreed by scholars, historians, and looking at this context, Paul is talking about not just in general resurrection from the grave, but a particular resurrection from the grave. And so the ancient Greek world, and again, this is Corinth, the ancient world did have a belief for the soul going to the afterlife. But in general, the body's bad. The body's bad. And so the soul is released from this prison house of the body, and the soul goes up, and it enters into eternal life, and maybe a good place. But Paul isn't just preaching particularly against that. So in the ancient world, there were three general views on resurrection. And there, you know, this shifts and changes in popularity throughout the ages. And so you can see which one is most popular today. The first one is on, on resurrection, that there basically is no resurrection in your body or soul. This is what is referred to as hedonism. And so body and soul cease to exist after you die. Why? Because there's really no soul in the first place. Your material you're just a conglomeration of electrical synapses in your brain, transfers of, of, of ideas, and that's it. And so in this view, there is nothing, nothing beyond this life. And Paul addresses this in verse 32. He says, oh, this is what those people say. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. So hedonism leads to pleasure now. So because there's nothing left there in the afterlife, there's no afterlife, let me do whatever I want now. Let me eat, drink, be merry, 
I make up my own rules in life. I create my own reality. I can change whatever I want in my own mind. Who dare, who are you to question me? Because everything in this life is all that there is. That's hedonism. The second is dualism, where the body dies, but the soul lives. This is most likely what the Corinthians thought. So the Corinthians are coming out of a pagan culture. Remember, this is a church plant, much like Fireside. This is a church plant, and they're coming out of this secular worldview. And they bring with them their secular ideas. And Paul is most likely correcting this. He's saying, Jesus, yes, his soul lives, but Jesus also was resurrected with a physical body. Jesus appeared to the apostles. Do you remember doubting Thomas? Doubting Thomas said, I, I, I just can't believe it. can't be real. can't be real. I got to touch it, Jesus. I got to touch your hand. Jesus says, come here. Come here, right here. Put your hand right here. And he touches his side, and he touches Jesus' hands where the nails were. Remember what Jesus said? Blessed are you, Thomas, because you believe. No, he said, you know, great that you believe, Thomas, but blessed are those who do not see and believe. And that's you. If you believe and you've repented and put your faith in Jesus, that's you. Because Thomas just couldn't think like, no way, no way. The body's supposed to die. No way. You don't get a body in afterlife. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, come and touch it. Come and feel my hands. Come and touch this hole. Come and feel my side. And Thomas is just like, it's true. It's true. And so Thomas likely shared the same view with the Corinthians. Soul, yeah, of course. But the body dies and it goes in the ground and rots. So you don't get a new one. And Paul says, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. And the sobering aspect of that is there's two purposes of getting a resurrected body. One to be fit to dwell in the presence of God. So right now, if you saw the full glory of God in your present body, you would die. You would die. This is why you couldn't touch the Ark of the Covenant. You would die. This is why Moses, when he asked, let me see your glory, God said, no, I don't want to kill you, Moses. I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and you can see the, the, the backside of me. But I cannot show you my glory or you would die. And so the positive aspect is if you're a believer, you will get a new body, no, no pain, no death, no disease, no decay, no dandruff, and you will never die, and you will be fit to dwell in the presence of God in the full weight of his glory. But if you do not turn from your sins, you will get a new body fit for eternal punishment that won't die away under, that won't just disintegrate under the full weight and wrath of God for eternity. Anything right now in this earth, if it deals with stress, your car, your engine, your, this, these, this floor planks right here, these chairs, this screen, everything, as the Bible says, waxes old and falls apart. Everything. The sobering reality is for those who reject Christ, they will be fit with a new body that can endure forever punishment. They will not be annihilated. They will not simply fall apart under the pressure and stress and torment and pain of God eternally, but they will be fit with a body that can endure it. Consciously, they will know it and they will endure it eternally. It is sober to think of this. And this is what Paul is arguing against. You get a soul. Yes, your soul continues to live in one place or another, but you also get a body. And that is the Christian view. The body and soul goes into eternity. eternity. Holism, like you think of the word holistic. It's, it's all encompassing. And that holism is what the Bible teaches. Whether you die in your sins or whether you have repented and trusted in Christ, you get a body fit for one place or the other. And this is so important. And this is the particular resurrection that Paul is arguing is so vital that Paul doesn't say, oh, as long as you just believe in Jesus, just believe in Jesus and that's all you need. 
he says, no, 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 there is a really important reason for this. And he says, furthermore, he continues to say, for if Jesus hasn't been raised physically, bodily from the grave, even we are found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. This is a kind word for saying liar. We found to have lied about God. Why? Why? Because the apostles were eyewitnesses to Jesus' bodily resurrection. Jesus came and visited them. Jesus came. He wasn't just some ethereal spirit. He ate fish, resurrected. He ate food, resurrected. It wasn't, he wasn't just a floating spirit, and the apostles testified about this. The apostles testified specifically to his type of resurrection, a holistic resurrection. You get a new body. And Paul says, if that's not true, Corinthians, if what you're thinking is true, then the apostles are to be found to be liars. And all people who have testified about Christ are found to be liars. All those hundreds of people who saw Christ bodily resurrected from the grave are liars. And Paul even uses strong legal language. This amounts to what is theological perjury on the stand of God Almighty himself, lying about his, what he witnessed. And Paul uses this strong ju judicial language. He says, we have testified. I call myself under legal witness of God. And Paul does that in his letters. He even at times calls on God to witness to his truth, to what he is saying. And so here he, again, he uses legal language. He's saying, if I'm standing in the courtroom of God, I will testify this on charges of perjury. The bodily resurrection of Christ is true. And it's serious. And it's a sobering thing. And again, it's sobering because you, I, the glorious thing about it, is you will be fit with a body to dwell rightly in the presence of God forever, or you will be fit with a body that can endure torment like you've never felt before forever without ceasing. As we read in Revelation not too long ago, the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever if Christ is not raised from the dead. And again, because he says, if, if there is no resurrection, then not even Christ has been raised. And so if you don't believe in a bodily, physical, bodily resurrection, not just your soul goes on and floats in heaven with fat babies flying shoulder height next to you in paintings with dead people who have been old for 300 and hundreds of years. No, no. If you have not been bodily resurrected, if Christ had not been bodily resurrected, your faith is futile. It's worthless because you cannot be fit to dwell in the presence of God. The apostles lied and you are still dead in your sins. Notice again, Paul just doesn't say, oh, well, you know, just, just believe in Jesus. Do you believe in the kernel of truth? As long as you got the little kernel, then you're good. As long as you believe the fundamentals, if you have a simple Young man, fate, you're fine. That's all you really need. No, Paul says, oh man, if you don't believe the truth about bodily resurrection, not just Jesus himself, but bodily resurrection, you are still in your sins. You are still lost. Sin is an active and continuing problem that needs to be solved. And Christ has not done it if he has not raised from the dead. This is really important. The Bible, when you read the Bible carefully and you slow down, not like, not like when you watch a TV show passively, whatever comes at me, okay, we just accept it, next channel. But when you slow down and you say, hmm, let me ask some questions of this text right here, like Paul is doing. Okay, what happens if Jesus didn't rise from the grave? Let me, let me ask you some questions, Corinthians. When you slow down, and take some time to meditate on Scripture, those spiritual disciplines that are so important, you begin to learn, and you begin to see why it is so important 
to understand particular truths because ultimately you do not want to settle on the truth. Well, you know, I just believe in Jesus. Paul says, you do that with the wrong thing, you are still in your sins and you don't want to do that. And then finally, Paul says, if Christ is not bodily and physically resurrected from the dead, then all those who have already died, and again, they use the word fallen asleep. We use these colloquialisms, pass away, kick the bucket, what have you, bit the bullet. Paul's fallen asleep was their way of saying died. Then all those who have already died in Christ, they have perished. That's the word, that's the, that's the word Paul uses over and over for hell. If Christ did not raise from the dead, rise from the dead, if he were not raised physically and bodily, then everyone who has already died, grandma, great grandma, grandpa, your friends that you know in, in accidents or who died an untimely death early, they, have, they are perishing right now. They are in hell under the full weight and wrath of God if Christ has not resurrected from the dead. And Paul even points to the despair despair. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. A couple decades ago, last century, there was Romanian persecution under, under com there was persecution in Romania under communism where many Christians suffered. Probably the, the most well-known, he, he, he delivered testimonies to U.S. Congress on communist persecution in Romania. His name is Richard Wormbrand. Highly commend you, commend his books and his writings to you. But there were other religious people who were persecuted. And there was a priest who was interviewed by the news and they asked him about his persecution under communism. And the reporter asked him an interesting question. She said, well, you know, just what if, what if, what if all of this is not true and you were persecuted for something that's not true? And that priest responded, well, then I've lived a good moral life and you know, I've done good things. And the apostle Paul says, wrong. You have lived a pitiable life. And it's sad because you hoped in this life only. This should move us to all the 70,000 plus people in Hardin County who do not believe in the resurrection, who think it's a fairy tale. If their hope is in this life only, if all they've got is hedonism, no soul, no body afterwards, this describes their life. It's pitiable. All they have hope for is the here and now to drive a nice car, to live in the best house possible, to get as much money as possible, and to live most comfortably as possible because there's nothing afterwards. Paul said that's pitiable. Because all you have hope for is this. This is the best you'll ever get. You know, and the sad thing is, probably the most, the most ironic thing is, is again, so this would be a, if all you have hope, so if, if you have died and, you, and Christ did not resurrect from the dead and you don't believe in that miracle that Christ physically and bodily resurrected from the dead, this is, this is how Paul describes that being in that position. This is exactly what liberal Christianity is. Liberal Christianity denies the miraculous supernatural things. It does say, oh, the parting of the sea. Oh, well, you know, a strong wind could have done that. And it wasn't really the parting of the sea. They just, they just kind of walked through the shallow parts. And it really just means they overcame difficult things in life. Jonah wasn't really swallowed by a fish. It's just, you know, a big moral story. to tell you to persevere. Jesus, resurrection, no, it, he just swooned and he was probably near death, but he came back and they kind of said, oh, you, we want to encourage you, so we're gonna tell this story about how he died. 
That's exactly what people who hold a Bible, go to church, but deny miracles are doing here. That's exactly what they're doing. And Paul says, that's a pitiable life because you have no hope in a real resurrection. And it's sad. And it's sad that the church has to be evangelist to a liberal church. Because the resurrection of Christ is factual, it is historical, it is the, one of the most greatly testified events in all history. The world changed literally based on that event. And it is true. And Paul, again, Paul says, well, here are, here are Corinthians, here's the ramifications if that's not true. Your life is in vain, you are still in your sins, and you are under the judgment of God. But thank God, we are not there. And Paul, so before that, Paul says, let's, let's kind of outline this. Few things, not even Christ is raised if there's no bodily physical resurrection. Our preaching is in vain. What me, Jesse, and Tristan do here is worthless. If you don't actually believe and the true historical fact of the, of the miracle of Jesus bodily and physically resurrection, don't waste your time. What we do is worthless. What Paul did is worthless, and we are fools to be pitied. We don't come here to just congratulate each other, help each other through life, and be our life coaches to one another. And say, oh, things are okay, just, just have positive thoughts, and you'll make it through, and you'll have a happy ending. That is not what we gather for. We gather to preach the miraculous, what God can do and did do. And what I do is worthless if Jesus Christ didn't actually physically raise from the dead. The apostles are lying. That, that book that you hold right now, it's vanity to believe in it. It's worthless if Jesus didn't rise from the grave. You are dead in your sins and all who have ever died before us are, are perished, have perished. It's worthless. So that's what happens if Christ is not raised. And Paul lays that on him heavy because you want to feel the weight of this. It's not just simple, I, I believe in Jesus, but those miracle things, we can't believe the impossible. But Paul then states the, fact, the truth of the matter. Christ is is raised from the dead. Praise God. And Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. And again, when he says this, he's not simply, he's talking about a particular type of resurrection, bodily, physically. It's not just some spirit floating around, but he has a body, and so will you too, if you have trusted in Christ and repented of your sins. And then he calls Jesus something particular. He calls them first fruits. First fruits. Now, if you know your Old Testament, you know it's an important day. That's an important day. After the, so before, on the first initial harvest of the season, God commanded his people to bring them the first fruits. And if the fruit was, and the, if the fruits fruit were good, that's a great indication that everything that's going to come afterward is good. And it belonged to God. The first fruits belonged to God. And his people were to offer them to him. And Paul calls Jesus the first fruits. You know, if you want an interesting chapter of the Bible to read, go to Luke chapter 24, and you will see people walking on the road and they're talking to one another. Man, what, what, what about that Jesus guy? Jesus enters the scene and he keeps them from recognizing who he is. And he walks next to him, kind of playing a game with him. He's like, hey, who y'all talking about? And they're like, where have you been, man? You ain't heard about this Jesus guy? You ain't heard about him? And he's like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, what, what about him? They're like, oh, he did this, and he did many miracles, and he did this, and he did this. And Jesus is like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, yeah, okay. And then they crucify him, and, and we don't know what to think. And then Jesus opens their noggins. He opens their mind, and he allows them to know who he is. And he said, oh, foolish ones, so slow to believe the promises of the Old Testament. And then it says, Jesus began to show them how the scriptures, when you see that capitalized with an S in your Bible, that's the Old Testament. The scriptures pointed to Jesus. That little festival, that little offering 
Jesus fulfilled it. Luke is saying, Jesus, Jesus was saying, that points to me. That offering was me first rising. Ultimately, I have fulfilled it. I rise from the grave first. Oh, and it's a great indication. You will too. In fact, it's a truth that you can stand on permanently. You can bet your life on it, and you should. And, and, and Paul calls Jesus the first fruits. And he pulls that Old Testament imagery because if the first fruit was good, then the rest is, is gonna look really good too. And, he's, and then he makes a parallel. And so, so if Christ is the first fruit and you believe in him, you too will be resurrected like him. See Romans chapter six saying the same thing. And then, and then Paul says, for as by a man came death, now man, and, and again, and, and the Hebrew Adam means man. And so Paul uses this word to refer to, to Adam. And you know that one man who came death, Adam. By a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. So one brought in death to us all. This is, this is what's referred to as federal representation. And sometimes we don't like that idea. Like, okay, well, you know, Adam represents me, and so I get all the difficulties that come with sin. I don't like that. Well, do you like the flip side? Um, Christ represents you. Are you perfect? Do you want his benefit? So you, you, gotta ha you can't have one without the other. Well, I don't like that, you know, I sinned in the garden or anything. I'm not, but the consequences of Adam's sin are impugned to you. Oh, I don't like that. Well, but you do like that Christ's righteousness is given to you new, even though you are not righteous. So it's the flip side of the same coin. Adam represented you, just like when, we go, when, when I was overseas, people saw me in light of what my government did, because I'm American. So, I, rep my, the govern so I, I bear what the government does. I represent the government to a, fair, to a certain degree as an employee of the government. And so I represented America. And again, Adam represents us, and we sin. And it wouldn't be any different. If you were in the garden with, with, with Eve, you would have done the same thing. You might have lasted a little bit longer. You would have sinned too. It's only a matter of time before you would have sinned. And you can say, for by one man, and you can insert your name, all came sin. And thank God for the second Adam. For in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. So you can't have one without the other. If you don't like that Adam represented you, you should also like that Jesus is offering to represent you. You should love that Jesus is willing to represent you. But you should also accept that, yes, Adam did represent me. He was my federal headship. We have a federal government. We use the same language. And so if you accept that Christ represents you, you can be made alive. But there's an order, and again, there's an order to this. Christ is the first fruits. Paul calls him first fruits again. He calls Jesus first fruits. And if Christ did physically, bodily resurrect, and God did accept him as the first fruit, then you follow in the promise. The promise is for you, and God accepted it. Praise God, he did physically, bodily rise from the dead. And so again, Paul, the summary is, Jesus is the first fruits. In Adam all died, and Adam represented you because you would have done the same thing. But Christ will represent you now. Who do you want to represent? You will, you will have two representatives when you face God. You have the choice. You can choose Adam. You can choose Christ. Choose Christ because he did rise from the grave. And there's a particular order. First, Christ. There's a resurrection that happened before the final and great resurrection, and that's Christ. And if you are faithful, even when you die, you will finally one day be bodily and physically resurrected from the dead. So praise God, Christ is raised from the dead. Now here comes, you know, the important, so what? So what? When, when people say, look, all you need to believe is believe in Jesus. That's it. That's all you really need. They really leave this question out. So what? So what if Jesus didn't rise from the grave bodily, physically? All I'd need to believe is in Jesus. They really don't ask this question. Paul puts a sharp point on this question. There are great consequences, great implications 
for Christ rising from the dead bodily and physically. It says, then comes the end. So it has implications for your eternity. If you don't believe the truth about Christ's resurrection, there are consequences on the last day. Then he says, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority, and power. You can just insert the word every right there too. You have two places to be. You can be in the kingdom or you can be in all of this right here. You have two choices. The kingdom of God, what is the kingdom of God? Because whatever it is, you want to be there. You want to be here, not there, right? So whatever the kingdom of God is, you want to know what it is because that's where you want to be because Jesus delivers it to God the Father. So whatever that is, you want to be in it. Brothers and sisters, I would present to you today, that is the local church. The kingdom of God visible today is the church. You want to be a part of a church, a Bible-believing, gospel-teaching church. If you are not, there's a chance that you may be in this category. And you want to be a part of the people of God. And so I'll say it this way. If you actually have God as your father, you also get brothers and sisters. Come to your brothers and sisters and worship the father. Because believing, believing certain things in error can have eternal consequences. And the Corinthians didn't think that. The Corinthians, oh, we don't know, no resurrection. We're still good. No resurrection, we'll go to hell. Okay, we'll believe that and go to hell. No, they were mistaken. And you don't want to be mistaken. And he will reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Those who do not believe the resurrection, Dr. Anthony Flew, world-renowned atheist, professor, all human accolades, it's going to be put under Christ's feet. He's going to be destroyed because he opposes Christ and his resurrection. And finally, the last enemy is death to be destroyed. And this is where we benefit so greatly. Those who have trusted in Christ, turned from their sin, believe all the words that the gospel teaches, the Bible teaches. There is no more death. Where is your sting, O death? And so the so what? The so what? Well, he delivers the kingdom to God. You want to, whatever this is, you want to be in it. And I would submit to you that this describes the local church. Every rule and power that is opposed to Jesus is conquered. All his enemies are put under his feet and death is destroyed. Brothers and sisters, this is no small doctrine. This is not simply going out and playing with bunnies and hunting eggs and eating candy. This is the crux. This is the pinnacle of all human history is this. The pinnacle of human history is the resurrection from the dead. We even date our whole existence, B.C., A.D., after this. Anno Dunamani is the year of our Lord when he was born. But Jesus' life on this earth, we date all history according to this. It is the most important thing. And what you believe about it is vitally important to whether you will see him in forgiveness and redemption and salvation or you will see him as judge. It is vitally important what you think about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, when Dr. Anthony Flew wrote that book in 2007, after nearly 40 years of teaching, he wrote a book changing his position. It made worldwide news. That's like saying Christopher Hitchens, Anthony Dawkins, Believe in God now. Whoa, what in the world? Dr. Anthony Flew was on that level. In 2007, he wrote a book, and he came out in his position, and he looked at the resurrection. The resurrection is what changed his mind. After years, even arguing with the greatest Christian thinker of our time, C.S. Lewis, he said, quote, the evidence for the resurrection is better than for claimed miracles of any other religion. It is outstandingly different in quality and quantity 
from the evidence offered for the occurrence of most other supposed miraculous events. He looked at the testimony of the apostles of the ancient world, of all human history, and he said, yeah. And he was commended by the people on the other side, the believers, because they said, thank you for following the truth wherever it may lead you. And again, his whole life was given to writing books on atheism, debating Christians, saying that they're foolish. And it was the resurrection of Jesus Christ that changed his mind. Now, he's a theist. He didn't come to believe in Jesus particularly. But he saw that this resurrection is no joke, and he could not deny it. And he changed his position. Brothers and sisters, this resurrection is true. It is real. Without it, you live in futility and sin and judgment. But with it, you have purpose. You have life and you have salvation. My prayer this morning is that we would follow in his first fruits, that we would be acceptable by turning from our sins, by believing in the true historical real event of the physical and bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in doing so, in faithful obedience to him, you will be saved. The second Adam, Jesus, offers life. If you have not done that this morning, this is the most important decision of your life. Nothing compares to this. This changes everything. But life without Jesus' resurrection is futility, sin, and judgment. This morning, I invite you to pray, to, to come, to give your life to Christ if you have not done so. If you have done so, faithfully follow. Believe every word. These are not simply wonderful stories to be moralistic, therapeutic, deistic stories. These are the true testimonies of God Almighty. And we celebrate this today in Resurrection Day. Let us pray. Our Lord, our God, our resurrected God-man, we thank you. We thank you that you have not left us in futility of life. But Lord, you have died and you have conquered the grave. You have resurrected in soul and in body. And Lord, you offer the same to us. Lord, you have offered forgiveness of sin. You have offered to wash us clean past, present, and future sins, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your graciousness. And Lord, you, uh, you offer us salvation salvation from the judgment we righteously deserve, we rightly deserve. Lord, I pray that every single person this morning hearing this has trusted in you, has turned from sin, and believes in the truth of the gospel. I pray that by your spirit, you would allow us and give us eyes to see like those people on the road to amaze. Let us see your word and believe with whole hearts. And we ask this in the wonderful name of the resurrected Jesus. Please stand and sing with us. I once was lost in darkest night. Yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and light had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will, and if you had not loved me first.
Resurrection Day Fireside, and thank you, Wayne, for that solid exposition on the resurrection. Beloved, have you tasted of this heavenly gift this morning, this gift that the Lord has given? Have you shared in the Holy Spirit? Have you tasted the powers of the age to come? Have you tasted the goodness of the Word of God? In other words, have you received resurrection life on the inside, and are you anticipating resurrection life on the outside. The Bible says that since Jesus has been resurrected, we have received the first fruits of God. On the one hand, that means that he is the first of many to come, many brothers who are going to be following him, like us. But it also means that God gave us his best. In Jesus Christ, we have received God's best, his only beloved son. Amen. And the way God calls us to respond to him this morning is to give him our best, is to give him the first fruits of our lives, to offer our lives as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. This is our spiritual act and reasonable act of worship. But it also means offering our finances to him in terms of our best. As we enter into our time of giving, this is a time of response to the first fruits God's given to us. In Christ, we don't give in order to get God's favor. We don't give in order to get God's grace. We give because of God's grace. Amen. In response to God's grace. And so, are you grateful and are you thankful for all that you have received in Christ this morning because of what the resurrection affords you? Let's respond cheerfully and sacrificially for all that God has done for us in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for sending your own son, Jesus. Lord, we understand that we do not deserve this great heavenly gift that you have sent in your son, Jesus. And Lord, I wanna pray that this morning that you would fill us with gratitude for the new life that you grant us through the resurrection of Christ. Lord, thank you that because we are united to Christ in his resurrection, we can walk in newness of life this morning. We thank you that because we're united to Christ in his resurrection, Lord, we can have new desires, and new minds that love you and hate our sin and grow in Christ's likeness. Lord, we thank you for these wonderful gifts afforded to us in the bodily resurrection of Christ. Lord, we pray this morning that you would fill us with gratitude for all these things as we respond to you uh, with our finances. In Jesus' name we thank you. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, God is good, amen? Amen.
and then we'll, as we jump into our announcements, I'm going to ask Ella to throw up our first slide there on Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. We're going to go over our memory verse for this week. So if you've memorized it, why don't you say it with me? And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, passing the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Well done, well done. And the next verse that we're going to be reading together um, today and then reciting together next week will be this one. Ephesians 2, 4 to 5. Say it with me. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Amen. All right, well, let's dive into our announcements for this morning. First off is Ladies Book Club. Um, Make sure, ladies, to come ready to discuss Jeremy Pierre's The Dynamic Heart and Daily Life. This is a book on biblical counseling. Excellent work. It's a big red book with a heart on it. Wonderful book. Um, Helps you understand um, heart-level discipleship. Group One will meet on the first Thursday in March and April from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. 30 a.m. at Colleen's home. Group two will meet on the first Saturday in March and April from 6 to 7.30 a.m. at Kelly's home. Uh, So please reach out to uh, Rebecca, Kelly, or Amanda if you guys have any follow-up questions on that. Secondly, we've got our membership class. Uh, We haven't done one of these uh, in person in a while, so we're really excited about that. We are going to be hosting a membership class here beginning nice and early, bright and early in the morning on April the 14th at 9 a.m. here in the rental facility. Um, It's going to be a five-week study into biblical membership. So if you're interested or if you have any questions about what does membership look like and why is membership so important to the Christian life and to biblical obedience, please contact Wayne Luna at the back and uh, he will get you connected. He was our preacher this morning. And finally, uh, I have an announcement about our members meeting that's going to be coming up likewise on April the 14th. Uh, In two weeks, we're planning to um, recommend that the Marsh family be released from membership. Uh, By God's grace, they're in good standing with the body at Fireside, and they are currently seeking out a church to join and have requested to have their membership released. So uh, we want to recommend them to you as elders to release them in good standing. Um, And with heavy hearts, the elders will also be recommending the next step of church discipline, um, unfortunately, for the Bundrick family, which is excommunication. And so we'll be discussing that at our next meeting. There has been the pursuit of this family, several attempts of meeting for working towards reconciliation for almost a year now. Um, And we've just not been able to find fruitful progression um, toward reconciliation. You know, one of the marks of a healthy church, according to the Bible, is that we take God's word seriously when we are talking about situations like this. That as we walk into this with heavy hearts, that we say, God, your ways are right. Your ways lead to life. That this is a way that we can help others who are lost in their sins be woken up out of them and be rescued on the last day so that they might experience resurrection life with their Lord. So if you have any questions or concerns about either of uh, these situations, please see one of the elders. Please ask us questions, any follow-ups that you would have. We would be happy to discuss with you um, at length. So uh, please let us know. Let's, uh, let's close in prayer and, and we will dismiss. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this blessed morning. Lord, we thank you that because Christ is raised from the dead, that we are saved and that we are not most to be pitied because you have rescued us from our sins. And Lord, I pray that as we go, that you would bless us and keep us. Lord, I pray that you would shine the light of your countenance upon us and be gracious to us and give us peace. Amen. Everyone said, go in peace. Amen.